Welcome to the fifth and final installment of the Fall 2017 UC Santa Barbara Innovator Stories Series. I'm John Greathouse, and you can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. We have a multi-decade innovator with us tonight. We have Meredith Amdur. She has been an investor and is an investor. She's been a board member. She's been a CEO. She's been a president. She's been a VP at some of the largest companies in the country, and she's been a founder of startup. Not many people have all of that on their resume. She's done it in different industries, including a number of data, um, data analytics companies, as well as consumer software businesses. So she's been in different industries, she's been in different companies, she's been in different roles. She has a very, a very interesting career. She's currently the CEO of Rhetoric Solutions, which is a UK, uh, UK technology company that's basically taking information analyzing uh, the information and giving it to sales and marketing teams so they can make more intelligent decisions. It's similar to her last job where she was the president and CEO of Wanted Technologies. Wanted was an analytics data company, but it was in the human resources space. So it was data, but in a different, selling into a different marketplace. Wanted was, it was a public company, um, which Meredith came in, uh, helped uh, fix some things that needed uh, a little bit of fixing, and she helped sell that business uh, she sold that business to um, the Gartner Group. So before, before Wanted, before Rhetoric, um, as I mentioned, Meredith had a number of senior positions. She was with companies that you've heard of, DirecTV, Microsoft, Deloitte, and Touche, as well as her original company in the UK, Informa Group. And you can imagine her accomplishments spanned a number of, of, of um, um, interesting areas of the business. I'll, give, I'll mention a couple to you. She was head of strategic planning for Microsoft's entertainment and devices division. And if you think in terms of the Xbox, um, if you've watched some of the old innovator stories, I know a lot of people around the world um, watch and listen to them. Uh, Robbie Bach was, was someone from Microsoft that was quite involved with the Xbox in the early days. Meredith and Robbie worked together for years. She, was also, she also serves at, served as the general manager of strategy for, at MSN for the Bing search engine. And she also led DirecTV digital marketing uh, DirecTV's digital marketing strategy. As I mentioned, she's a startup founder. She was a co-founder of a company in London, of all places, pretty much right out of school, um, in, a, in a kind of at a point in, a lot in her life that you guys are getting close to now. That was a, a business information publishing and global market research company. She en ended up selling that business as well, and we'll talk to her a little bit about that experience. She earned her, M earned her MBA from Cornell University her MSc from the London School of Economics, and her undergraduate degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Now, I ran into Meredith through, really as a business associate. She was, her company wanted, was partners with the company that I'm involved with. Um, and over the years, getting to see how she interacted with our company and just really the, 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 way, she, um, the way she interacted, very high ethics individual, very high work ethic, um, and very self-aware high emotional intelligence, really the perfect kind of person that I want to bring into this classroom. Because it's someone who can look back at their career and be very honest and open about what worked, what didn't work, and hopefully along the way as we discuss her career, there's going to be some insights um, for everyone in this room as well as the people listening to this online. Let's welcome Meredith to our class. Well, that was embarrassing. That was not embarrassing. Oh my God. You've I, had I quite ancient. the career. Yeah, you well, I've done feel... all those things at the same time, so I'm yes. really not that old. And yes, and you're 28, <laughs> right. which I didn't right. want to say on camera, but you forced it's me to say Young at heart, young at heart. Young at heart, exactly. Um, so you said a number of interesting things, um, and it's all documented on the internet, so it must be true. Um, so I want to start with one of them. You said you're you said a career is a business, and you are the CEO of that business. And I think that's just absolutely a good place for us to start here, because that's, yeah. that's what we're talking about here today. What did you mean by that? How can, how can young people learn from that? And how has it manifested itself in your career? I mean, we're going to dive into individual things you've done over yep. time. But in a macro sense, what does that mean? I mean, like a lot of wisdom is that sometimes it comes after the fact, right? If you'd asked me at 22 whether I was the master of my career, I probably didn't know that. I would have said something like, I don't know, this seemed like an interesting opportunity. Right. I didn't know how to do it, but I just jumped in. And on reflection, when I kind of looked back and was asked to, if I could stitch my career together and find some themes, what was the theme? And I realized that entrepreneurship 
isn't just the company you work for. Your career is your ultimate business. You're sort of managing all the skills and experiences you collect. So it is inherently entrepreneurship, and you are her inherently the only person that can be responsible for your own career. And right. sometimes when you go to big companies, it feels like they're supposed to tell you, this is the next promotion, the next promotion, now you do this. Um, but I think in actual fact is treat it like a business and think about what are your next steps and what do you want to get out of it. Well, I, I think easier said than done, right? I think at the time, you, it <laughs> often, you often feel, it often feels like it's serendipitous. Yeah. Um, but I think you and I are both real believers in increasing your odds, putting yourself in the right place yeah. um, at the right time and being self-aware enough to know when that opportunity is knocking. So something else you said that I found really interesting, and, and this is kind of, I feel like it's going to be a theme that we're going to explore. You said each time, uh, each time she moved in her career, I leveraged what I had, what I had with someone who would pay for it. So yeah. in other words, what you came into the relationship right. with, but then you, but you did it so you could learn the next thing. Yeah. And I think that's really, a really interesting way to think about your career management. Okay, what do I have that's marketable? What can I, you know, what can I make money doing? It's obviously things you enjoy doing. You're not looking for things that are making you miserable. And then when you're looking at what that next opportunity is, what am I going to learn in that opportunity that right. later will build and grow on the foundation that I've already created? So in, in the 1990s, you started Informa Media, as I yeah. mentioned, yeah. Um, a UK-based publishing company. You went, you know, you're in London. You're a foreigner in a foreign land. You're a relatively young person, fairly unexperienced. In I exploited that too. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, all, we all take our assets and do what we can with them. But you were inexperienced. You were a first-time founder. Yeah. Um, how did you end up in that situation? And then, and then it's a bit of a two-part question. And then what skills did you then leverage in your next gig? Yeah, I mean, this is, again, it's always more strategic when I think about it 20 years after the fact. But I think at the time, I, I often start with undergrad because mm -hmm. what the heck was I? I used playing the French horn you were in a high French school. Horn. Did you get a scholarship or something? I did. I mean, did I want to be a professional musician? Not really. But when I found out that they were short of French horn players and I could get 10 grand a year if I were willing to say I'd be a music major, I said, well, how long would I have to say that <laughs> to get the money? and also do the courses I really want to do. So I took it up, and there you go. I mean, I, I So you started playing French horn? No, 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 sorry. I was a French horn player in high school. You must have been pretty talented, though. I mean, you, can't, you have to audition for these things. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, again, I like being a small fish in a big pond. That's another one of the great lessons, is don't try to necessarily feel like you have to win at Google. There's a lot of places you can learn. French right. horn is a pain in the neck instrument. It's not easy, so fewer people did it. I was a flute player that someone said, I need French horns. I thought, huh. French horn, I could probably get to all state band if I take the French <laughs> horn, okay. And maybe it all started there when right. I was 14 years old, but the point being, being good at that got a scholarship. Yep. From that point, London is sort of an interesting one. Um, I was at the London School of Economics and the dollar collapsed and it was really expensive to be there, but I was determined to stay in London and do this econ degree. And an American research company was just setting up called Paul Kagan Associates, and they needed cheap labor. <laughs> cheap labor is a great thing. The only thing you have to leverage there is willingness. And they said, well, people who can write some newsletters and you know, hack through some spreadsheets, I'm like, well, how hard could that be? And I'm willing to take five pounds an hour to do it. Leverage point number one. So within six months of working pretty much illegally under the table, um, this is being filmed, by the way. Yeah, I know. I, what, this <laughs> They're going to come This is the 90s. You. you guys weren't even born yet, right? <laughs> um, but the fact was, that experience allowed me to have something on my resume that said, I know something about the emerging media, what we called multimedia at the time, mm -hmm. emerging technology segment. Right. Because I was writing these newsletters and building these models for American investment banks that were trying to get overseas. So as one thing kind of plays into another, I leveraged this tiny bit of experience, more or less writing newsletters and building these crappy little cable forecast models, because someone out there needed somebody that knew how to forecast a cable model. So you just kept going to the next step. You said, how did I wind up doing a startup? Well, I didn't want to leave London. It was sort of fun, and you know, it's fun being 22 and overseas, and yes. I wasn't ready to come home, and I needed a work permit. I mean, again, a lot of this isn't particularly glamorous. It's just rather than give up, it's like, well, who would need somebody who has my skill sets and is willing to get me a work permit mm -hmm. to do it? Well, there was this newsletter company that had sort of picked me up to help them along, and that company had hired Tim Baskerville, um, mm -hmm. who was what connected me, I think, with John in the first place at this company in Santa Barbara. But 
said, well, this little company could use a managing editor. A managing editor? How on earth? Right. I, I can't do that. Well, no one else had done it. What I didn't know at the time is that this woman who ran the thing, it was a Merrill Lynch funded newsletter company, had burned through three managing editors in six months. The last one faked a heart attack <laughs> because she was so hard to work for that he just couldn't stand it. Wow. But again, I was willing to take this on and leverage like, I need to learn how to, I don't know how to manage people. I think I'm now 23. I guess I could, how hard could this be? Maybe right. she's crazy, I'll so work hard. Naivete. She was insane. Um, I will not name names, but boy did I learn how to pull an all-nighter, get the copies set, manage people who were all older than I was. Um, was she just trying to be abusive? I mean, what was... You know, there's, you... I'm no psychiatrist. I'm sure there were issues, but I think there's, a, there's also a streak in a lot of entrepreneurs, which this woman was, that you do anything to try to get this out. And I was willing to go with that energy. I'm like, well, I've got the energy, so we'll, we'll just do this. Um, we're in this moment, um, and I'm sure I can get something out of it, right? So I did. So I went from I can write a newsletter, I can basically build a model. Mm -hmm. Now I know how to manage deadlines and other people and create a product. Um, Tim Baskerville was the publisher of this company. He said, look, this woman is insane, mm. so let's, uh, let's do something new. Let's build our own company. Mm. Would you be up for building a startup in London? Oh, here's the thing. I'm going to live in California. You're going to stay in London and build it. Now I think I'm 23 and a half. Like, okay. Accidental entrepreneur. I didn't know. I just knew that I wanted to stay. I knew I could get a work permit. Mm -hmm. um, there was this brand new career management development for young, young management program between the UK and the US. So again, it all sounds easy when I play it back, but they were big decisions to make at the time. Shouldn't I move back to the US? Why am I over here? What am I doing? Um, mm -hmm. Is this gonna be good for my career or not? Most people do an international experience after having had a career. I was sort of starting my entire professional life overseas. I had no idea how that might play out, but in fact, we built something very real and you know, eight years later, sold it to a UK company. And I said, all right, well, there's two things I want out of the sale. I'd literally emptied my bank account. I think the, our backer had sort of wanted to see what my credit card bills were. They literally leverage everything. They wanted to make mm -hmm. sure we were completely committed. So I said, well, I want somebody to pay for an MBA. And I'd like to get home as soon as possible, please. They said, well, we'll, we'll pay for the MBA, but you need to do a one-year management contract. And that's when I learned that uh, mm. you have to say very clearly what you want. So by the end, I was so ready to come back. Right. And it was 2001. The market was tanking. So I sort of picked my, why business school. Well, because the market was tanking. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask you in a minute here a little bit more about that MBA. And, yeah. And, but let's go back to something you said that I found interesting. I, I don't know about you, but in my career, I think I've learned more from bad bosses than I did from good bosses. It's probably yes. not true, but I feel like that. because. I would have, you know, every young person, unfortunately, most young people are gonna have a bad boss at some oh, point. Yeah. And you can kind of take two paths with it. You can either, you know, you can just go to get loggerheads and just make them wrong and have a horrible experience. Or you can sort of use it as a, as a learning experience right. and say, look, I'm never gonna be like that person. It's clearly inappropriate what they're doing, yeah. but I'm gonna learn from that experience. So did you feel like, cause you, you mentioned in there that you said you became good at managing people. I would assume you didn't emulate her style. Did you find that no, you No, I protected everyone from the worst of that. So that might have made you even more, yeah. more protective. I, was, I figured out how to manage the worst of the, and I, when we say abusive, I mean that, you know, and again, you have to take the good and the bad in entrepreneurial per personalities, and we see it all the time, you know, certainly with, with the Uber situation, is sometimes these are just incredibly driven people. And it isn't rational, it's cruel, there's a lot of bad things, but if you can manage through that, if you can figure out how, to, how do you make someone content, how do you manage their worst impulses, you actually learn skills that at a very young age, I think I was just scared to death most of the time, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. somehow I didn't want all of our writers to realize I was petrified, so I was determined to kind of put on this very brave right. front, and like, well, I'll deal with the mania. I also had the benefit of the investor group in New York. They kind of knew how tough it was, so every so often they'd have me on the phone, like, don't worry, you're doing okay, you're doing <laughs> fine, because they knew the three people before me right, had quit, right, and right. that if they couldn't keep me, the whole, the publication would start stop publishing. Wow. Um, I think the learning, of course, is I didn't realize the power I had. I mean, there was a lot of naivete. I was mm -hmm. deeply insecure. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that insecurity can be a great career advantage. Is 
at some point you have to build the, the courage of your convictions, but at the time you work that much harder. Mm -hmm. um, so I certainly appreciate better management and think I'm a better management because I could say, I would never do that. I would never make unrealistic assumptions of people at two in the morning. Yeah. I won't call people at five o'clock on a Sunday night right. because I need to talk about right. something. Right. It'll wait. I put little delays on my Sunday night email so that they don't land in someone's email box until mm. the morning. Mm. You don't need that stress. Mm. Um, because I had a lot of that, and right. that was, by the way, been back when it was CompuServe. Yes, Just, yes. Yeah. Well, myself. so you did learn from that. I mean, I, I think I think I'm a similar way. We, the the highs are high and the lows are lower in a startup world. You know, so it's just everything's dramatic and crazy. And I remember having to sit down with some people that worked on my team, and I would say, "There's no excuse for being a jerk." I didn't use the word jerk. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no excuse for being a jerk. Yeah. We're all stressed out. This is a startup. But that does yeah. not give you a reason to be mean to somebody. No, it should be fun. I mean, I think the, the, the reason I've done so many different things is I find this genuinely fun. If your work isn't fun, if you don't enjoy who you're working with, then it's an awful lot of hours to devote yeah. to it. And, right. you know, don't be I, a martyr. Go do something you enjoy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not saying you know, the whole debate about follow your passion or let your passion find you. I don't think my passion was to do data analytics and <laughs> recruiting. Right. I don't think my passion is necessarily marketing intelligence. The right. passion is building an amazing group of people, exactly. solving difficult problems, yep. and creating something. I think you can do it in a lot of different areas and build on expertise in different ways. Yep. Um, That's but, a, very similar yeah. how I've described it. Is is you know I really at the end of the day enjoy the teams and enjoy yeah. the people and watching them grow and then hopefully we made some money and they succeeded yep. and they were able to do things with their personal life that they could And it have can done. be in big companies or, or entrepreneurial. Sure. I think one of, I can't remember that. I think there was a question out there somewhere about what, what, what this expression, execupreneur. That's, that's what I was gonna ask you next. <laughs> Somebody's trying to call me. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask you that next. So um, I, what do you mean by that? I think that to me, in the same way that I and think about a career. Executpreneur. Right? Yeah, executpreneur. Um, that I've been both in massive companies, uh, mainly because I felt like after my small companies, I needed to prove something. Like, did I just get lucky? Did I just bump into these random things because I was an American in London and they needed my help and I was cheap? Or am I actually really good? So I decided I better prove my mettle, go to Deloitte, go to Microsoft, um, and realized when I got to these big companies that, man, they could do for a dose of small companiness. Right. That the waste, there, there's just a lot of, spending and internal politics, and these are just the nature of organizations. Yeah. So it's, it's neither good nor bad, but that entrepreneurship isn't just starting your own company. It's thinking more like an entrepreneurial leader, even in an executive setting yeah. in a larger organization. So I think even if I'm back in a big company, that I take a very entrepreneurial approach. And by that, one of the classic questions I like to ask in job interviews is, what do you do when the printer's broken? And the the person you want to hire, the person I like to hire, is the person who says, well, I usually kind of pull off the back of the lid and I <laughs> snuck around, but enormously, not a lot of people may admit this, but you'd may be how many people do admit it. They is, walk away. They walk away, or they look for the admin. Like, no, I want the person who will actually attempt to fix it and mm. make an effort before they walk away or call the admin or right. IT support. Right. It's an attitude, and I think a lot of entrepreneurship isn't just, I have a great idea and I'm a genius, I'm going to build it. It's Whatever needs to get done today, somehow we'll figure it out. Right. And in my current role, I don't know half of what I'm doing day to day, but I'll figure it out or I'll figure out the person who does know. Um, and executpreneurs, I can still be that and, and be the CEO, but I'm still willing to fix the printer if I have to. Yep. Did you, did you coin that word? Maybe. I get just the URL. I stitch words get together. Don't do I need steal to own it. it? Please don't, don't steal take it. it. I'm going to go. I better go and. Trademark. I'm going to hold that one. Um, no, I thought yeah. it was clever. Yeah. Um, did you, and I want to put you on the spot, but are there other. Uh, questions you ask recruits because a lot of these folks are going to be uh, trying to get jobs. I mean, I think it's sort of the the old energy question: what kinds of tasks give you energy, and which sort of tasks drain you of energy? I, I did not invent this one myself, but someone once mentioned that often in interviews say, "What are your strengths and what are your weaknesses?" Well, oh my gosh, awful question. The better way to you ask should it get is, up and walk out of yeah, don't you that. don't strengths and weaknesses. I don't want to work here. The weaknesses I worked so hard. Right, yeah. perfectionist. I work, I work too hard, yeah. I'm a perfectionist. Yeah. But I think the real, somebody had told me once that when you talk about a weakness, it's not that it's a weakness, it's some things drain you. Working through management accounts drains me. I find it exhausting. I respect that I have to do it, it's part of my job, but mm. it doesn't give me energy. And in an interview, sometimes the, the, you're trying to get at, especially in your first couple of jobs, is I, we talked about this in our session earlier, 
I'm not sure it matters what you major in, but are you a creative problem solver? Do you right. have passion? Right. Can you think problems through and will you just jump in? Um, but what are the things that actually give you energy? Some people say solving big thorny strategic questions, you know, what comes for Google after search? I don't know. I mean, but some people love those questions. Other people say, oh, I find that exhausting, mm -hmm. but I really like a coding problem because it, it helps sort of isolate where mm -hmm. are you going to do your best work. So I usually try to ask about what just drains you. I'm not, it's not a gotcha question. It's just don't put someone in a role and the things that they just right. find exhausting and right. taxing. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good one. And I think another thing to think about if you're interviewing is if you give an answer, have an example. Like yeah, people don't remember right. answers, they remember stories. So if you say, you know, that you're a, perfe a perfectionist or whatever, not a great example, but yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but then say why. Go, oh, and the reason I say that is, and then give that story to the person. They're yeah. probably going to remember the story. Um, we'll get off this point, but I'll, yeah. I'll throw out one other one that I thought was clever. I never asked this one in particular, but it was um, CEO, and he said he would ask people, what were the traits in your parents that, bothered you as a kid growing up. And the reason we asked that, it wasn't just a frivolous That's a question, great question. Because people, most people, and you guys will see this as you get older, um, work to overcome the traits that they didn't. I mean, we mm. I always joke with my kids, I'm like, I'm not making the same mistakes my parents made, but I'm making different ones, and so will you. Yeah, so we don't make the same mistakes. And if there's something in, in a parent that you really that bothered you, you will tend to overcompensate. Yeah. To not be that person. So he was just looking for. That's actually that's a great question because I think all of us probably when you said it, said, huh, what would be that? Yeah, because right. you already got me thinking about it. Right. But, the other thing know. is you, he he says that weeds out the the BSers from the people that want to get real. Yeah. And if you if somebody gives you a real corporate answer. He's like, that's not what I'm looking for here. I want you to get real with me here. Like, tell me about your parents. Yeah, the minute I get an overly, don't yeah, yeah. tell Rehearse. me what I want to hear, yeah, I, yeah. I go out of interview mode entirely, right. and I'd rather talk about politics, a movie, <laughs> anything, because usually I just want to see how people think. Well, here's what I would do, and we really will get off this topic, but when people would go into total, total corporate speak, or what they thought I wanted to hear, I would ask them something like, hey, what was your nickname growing up? <laughs> and if they wouldn't give me something, I just, I, wouldn't end, I was done. You give them a nickname. I give them a nickname. <laughs> You're not going to get hired. That's your yeah, nickname. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, get real with me. I mean, I, I don't want an interview. I want to get to know you. And there yeah. were some people that the veneer would never come yeah. off. And, and it's tough because it, it's one of those, it's hard to give advice because it's so much who are you interviewing with. A lot of big companies sure. have these loops. Certainly in Microsoft, getting hired involves meeting usually with a minimum of five people. If you get a sixth, that means everybody, the first five you met have already given you a hire, so you only get to your sixth person when mm. you actually have a chance at an offer. If your loop stops at five, you're, you probably didn't get it. Mm -hmm. um, but each person is different, so sometimes you have to know, is this the person that has to manage you? Mm. Is this the person who is going to compete with you? Because they will mix up who you're talking to. Uh, so sometimes be, be and careful. And they don't make it clear? They don't give you a good um, background? You, you know, you should know the, you'll know the name and title, but I'd say the trick is ask a few questions about the person you're, who's interviewing you. Yeah, for sure. For one thing, people always like to talk about themselves. Oh, yeah. So, and you're giving me this, this awkward, but anyway. Right, yeah, well, so I that's, told my, you we that's my only tip is see if, whatever you can learn about their role relative to you. It's okay to say, yeah, for sure. great, are you, are you the team leader? Would you be the person? And then when you'll see, is there a competitive issue? Or mm -hmm. if it's an accounting field, some accountants, they will never go to what's your nickname. I right, mean, they literally right. want to hear, do you know how to run a balance sheet? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, anyway. Debits and credits. So I'm going to go to my first student question in a second, but yeah. um, I have one more for you. So you've also called yourself the world's o oldest millennial, and I'd love to know what you mean by that. Um, it's funny, because now millennial has so many definitions. I'm not sure if I've made it sound like a good thing or a bad thing. but. <laughs> I think at some point we started looking at careers and realizing that there was no more, I'm going to join IBM and work there for 25 years. Mm -hmm. and when I say I'm obviously not a millennial, I'm a, uh, an early Xer, but I never thought about, I never assumed that I would have a company that was going to take care of me for my whole life because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Most of this opportunistic sort of approach to career is, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up, but mm -hmm. I want to do it in a disciplined way. I don't just hop off of a job when I'm bored of it, right. um, which I think is the knack of that they'll, the knock on some millennials. Oh, I'm bored. I don't feel important. I got to go to get to a more important place. I say oldest millennial, that I've always taken a very portfolio-based approach. Um, think about what the next thing is. What do I need to learn? And back to the, your very first question about trade-offs is, 
I was willing to trade my knowledge of entertainment to take me to Xbox. At Xbox, I got to learn about technology. Mm -hmm. When I was at Microsoft and I knew about technology, DirecTV, an entertainment company, didn't want me for entertainment. They wanted me for technology. So I just kept leveraging each of those pieces. Is that a millennial move? No, it's just being more opportunistic, moving around a little bit more. Don't, don't be scared to take a leap. Um, and there's an article, or it's a, I think it's a book by Reid Hoffman, one of the LinkedIn founders, and he started talking about how really these days companies should be making contracts with employees. Mm -hmm. That let's not kid ourselves. Are you really going to sign up for 15, 20 years? Well, you could. At some companies at Microsoft, you could generally work there for that long and have very diverse set of experiences. But in most cases, we say, look, here's the deal. You're really good at SEO marketing, and I need that. But I also need these other things. So if you're willing to come here and work on these three campaigns, I'll give you exposure to the product development team because I need a good marketing liaison. Does that feel like a fair trade? Because that's mm -hmm. actually what's, yep. what's happening um, in a more modern way of thinking about what is the agreement. And maybe it is three years. And maybe that's actually what the company needs to do too. Right. Um, and I just think the nature of work has to change and outsourcing is changing and robotics, all these things that scare us is partly it's thinking about a new way to, to look at work. Well, and I think that's why I ask you the first question, because I think these folks have to be more entrepreneurial than the generations before them, just yeah. by definition, just the way things are going to Yeah, I just didn't know any, know any better, and recessions are a great focus point. Well, so. when I was their age, they, entrepreneurs were a very separate thing. They were mm. just crazy, like, oh my gosh, they don't. A wild mad scientists. They can't be hired. They're un un you know, untamable. <laughs> yeah, you can't tame them. Yeah, I'm like, yeah you can. And, and, it's, and I think this, the, the apertures just widened um, yeah. You yeah. Know, considerably as to what, what. Well, that's what technology has enabled new businesses, new products to be launched in very different ways. And I think back to you can be in a very big company but work on a very small product team. Right. And that product team can feel like a startup. And that's, you, you mentioned Robbie Bach. I mean, a lot of ways, the entertainment and devices division at Microsoft was a rather gigantic startup, but within Microsoft, we were the renegades. Mm -hmm. We were completely different yeah. from the rest of Microsoft. Our metrics didn't match. Our style didn't match. What we were building was very different, mm -hmm. and culturally, it was, it was a challenge. Um, but Xbox did come out of it. Yeah, we may end up talking a little bit yeah. more about that in a second. Let's take the first student's question. Okay. So I notice you hold two Bachelor of Arts degrees in addition to a Master's in Science. What is your advice for a Bachelor of Arts student that feels he or she is outmatched in the tech industry by more Bachelor of Science oriented candidates? So non-technical. Oh, non-technical. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I have my theories about these things, so you can take it with a grain of salt. So I, I literally did a Bachelor of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies, which is my way of saying I couldn't really figure out how to balance history, economics, English, art, and music into one thing, so I picked a region of the world and created my own degree. Did I have any skills that set me up for a job? Of course not, but clearly I learned how to talk a lot. Um, so I think... I'm a big believer that get as broad an exposure as you can, and if you can communicate your willingness, and three other things. Take an accounting class, take a computer science class, and one other thing that allows you to do something or at least communicate. Yeah, don't worry. If you throw a spreadsheet in front of me, I'm okay. Um, the MSc is interesting. At London School of Economics, everything is sort of a master of science. Um, in some ways, the value from a master's degree, it was a one-year master's program, was more that I wanted to get to Europe and really experience and challenge myself in a class of people from all over the world and a very different way of teaching. I mean, there's no textbooks. You get a syllabus that's 20 pages long with here's all the things you could read from the original sources mm. on Keynesian economics. Have a go, and I'll see you in June when there's a huge exam, and, exam to determine your entire degree. <laughs> That was a learning right there. Um, but I do think if I were doing it now, I would probably struggle more with, gosh, do you need a, BA, do you need a technical degree to get entry? Um, the benefit is with all the boot camps and the other technical skills, it's not that you need to learn to code unless you want to literally code. It is helpful to understand the basics of technology, to understand what's a back end, what's a front end, when mm -hmm. would you use Python, where does C fit in, what does the front engineer do, what do the UI UX designers do? Because you may wind up managing those processes or building a wireframe that describes how a product is built. It doesn't mean you need to be the coder, but just to develop 
the fluency. Um, so I, I don't know that I have an easy answer for you, but yeah, I did one of each, a, a BA, an MS, and an MBA. Um, but the most influential is really just what gets your brain working. Um, and yeah, nowadays I probably would have taken more computer science rather than less. I think you know my version of computer science was Fortran and Basic, yeah, yeah, so that C++. doesn't doesn't really count. But um, I realized I probably was never going to be a coder, and I would have been scared to death to do engineering. Um, but it doesn't mean I didn't learn to understand what engineers do and how to interview them and evaluate them. Even though I'm the first to say I can't do what you do. I will trust you to do what you do. And I think just healthy respect. I will never say I know what I do not know. Um, and nowadays, you have to. No one can know everything. Um, that's actually kind of scary. I mean, how many of us can fix a broken toilet? Not as many as we should. Uh, that's we not got, bad. We got two. There you go. But yeah, I mean, to me, it's the same point, is can you actually fix and build things? Because it's the same mental skill um, if something breaks down. Anyway, very long answer to your question. But I think, I agree with you, I think it's, because I'm not a technical person either, and I worked in technical companies, I think it's respecting what they do, and the only way you can really respect what a technical yeah. person does is understand it. Yeah. It also allows you to, to have really um, relevant conversations when you talk about deadlines. Yeah. If somebody's trying to bamboozle you with a bunch of yeah, jargon. What's, what's possible, you're like, right? Listen, I mean, come on, I'm not a coder. And so some of, the, some of the folks watching this or listening to it might say, well, yeah, well, that sounds great, but you know, at my university, I can't get into any of those classes, which is the, tr the case here. Like, if you're, if you're not a comp sci student. MIT online. I was going to say, yeah. all the code academies. Yeah. I mean, there's no, it's like the printer thing. Yeah. Look, like the printer's broken, fix it. Like, don't well, just go, well, I would fix the printer, but I can't. Yeah, don't, don't worry about whether the course is available. I mean, I, I actually did take an, a Python course just because I need to understand how hard it really was. Yeah. Um, the and information's most of them are free. out there. It's, it's out there. It's and out it's, there. And, it, and most yeah. of it is free, so, so don't let that uh, stand yeah. in your way. Let's, you mentioned Tim. So Tim is uh, someone that we both know and um, wonderful, wonderful human being. So he was a mentor to you early in your career. Yep. He's had, he kind of popped back into your career. Yeah. And then I know you had a mentor at Microsoft. Yep. I'd love for the students to hear a little bit about your experience as someone who has been a mentor, but, yeah. but also early in your career when you were cultivating these mentor relationships. Yeah, I mean, you really can't put too fine a point on it. It's incredibly important to have somebody who at least encourages you and introduces you. So Tim Baskerville, who we're talking about, um, who's an investor also mm -hmm. and, and leader in one of John's companies, mm -hmm. um, he was brought in as a publisher to this crazy person company, as I mentioned. And he was also probably the one that knew they couldn't afford to lose another mm -hmm. editor. So they were going to try their hand with this 23-year-old who didn't know what she was getting herself into. But in a very subtle way, he kept convincing me that, of course, you can do this. You know, I know it's 3 in the morning and this, she's driving you crazy. Just <laughs> keep, it's going to be OK. It's going to be fine. I keep thinking of the Devil Wears Prada, like so this really it, evil uh, person. That was a hard movie to watch for exactly that reason. Um, <laughs> except it was a publishing company, but yeah, and it was sort of funny. So we ended up building this new company together, um, and I realized, wow, he trusted me enough to you know, live in LA and hand me the reins to build a 20-person team right. in London, and I didn't think I was capable, and he used to, I think he still jokes now that I never knew how much I was capable of doing, so he was able to exploit it, and we, <laughs> we will laugh over it a little bit, um, but he used to joke, he said, someday we're gonna do another business together. So lo and behold, MBA and a bunch of other jobs later, when he came knocking on the door, mm -hmm. say, and you had stayed in touch with him, you were oh, co-investor. Yeah, we had stayed in touch, yeah. and uh, I'd which I think is important. And another lesson yes. for these folks is the people you meet when you're 23, 24 often come back in your yeah. life later on. And they may not be even direct. I was joking with the guys who were smart enough to come to the, our little session before. It's like just having met you today, I will remember. And if someone says I need an intern. I will know just because I happen to meet you. There's no good supply and demand in the job mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Anybody you meet anywhere might be your ticket to somebody you might meet. Tim Baskerville says, you know, there's this guy, John Greathouse. He might be an interesting person for you to talk to and just understand mm -hmm. better. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, he sounds like an interesting person. He was wrong, but that's yeah, okay. I don't know. <laughs> but I didn't even know what, what we were, either of us were expecting out of the first conversation, but it led to me sitting here today and me potentially finding new employees or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So again, sometimes it sounds trite. I don't like networking. I mean, I like to talk, but I really, I mean, who likes networking really? It, it's, books are written about it. There's nothing fun about it, but I think most interactions are some way to leverage it. So whether it's a, a, a specific mentor 
or somebody that can provide some degree of mentorship in a moment when you're asking a question is keep that connection alive because that person might be someone you wind up working with again or mm -hmm. need to hire or mm -hmm. may need to hire you. I was joking about a lot of my team at DirecTV. I like to think I hired just an awesome team. They're all smarter than me. And I said, why am I doing this? Because you're going to have to hire me when I'm ready to retire and need some extra money. <laughs> I think you're all going to be great. And we still keep it up. They're my mentors, but they mentee, they're mentors to me as well. Mm -hmm. I learn as much. It's a two-way street. I totally believe that. So. These long-term relationships, the mentee often helps the mentor. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Microsoft. So that was Tim in your early days and now. And now. Yeah. What about the Microsoft mentor? Different? person, different type yeah, of mentorship. Yeah, so then we entered big company land. Um, again, feeling like I hadn't proven enough with building a company and selling it um, in my accidental entrepreneur days, I took kind of the more traditional path. I got an MBA, I went to Deloitte Consulting where, again, three tiers for consulting, you will learn so much, um, especially for those of us who don't quite know where they fit. Management consulting is a great way to learn a lot of different skills. Um, and again, the leverage point, I was useful to Deloitte because guess what? I'd spent a chunk of time in mm -hmm. international. Mm -hmm. Very few new coming in consultants had experience in the international media and entertainment business. That helped me into the door at Deloitte. Um, and I learned a lot there from the senior partners, including when I got this opportunity to go to Microsoft um, to lead strategy for Xbox, I remember talking to the partner saying, I actually really like consulting. I'm at, I'm at an impasse, should I do this? And he even said, no one says no to being the head of strategy for Xbox. I'm like, I don't even game. I mean, what do <laughs> I know? He said, but that's the whole point. You right. know entertainment, their technology. Um, so when I first landed at Microsoft, this was genuinely separate from Deloitte Consulting, my first time in a large corporate environment and all the politics and layers and internal selling and deck writing before you actually got any product to the light of day mm. and ever even talked to a customer, um, it was a maze. And I had a, a mentor there, my, my CFO, Mindy Mount. I had a lot of hard things I needed to learn, right? Because the, the challenge of being in a freewheeling environment when you're in a small company is you're kind of making up the rules and it's very informal and you can tell, right? I just talk and I freewheel. That doesn't always work in certain settings, mm -hmm. right? Microsoft, while a tech company, can be extremely corporate, structured. Stop talking. Listen. Think first, and a lot of that is because in technology, a lot more linear thinking. Do not go from A to D to Z. Oh, you go man. A, B, C, D. Learning how to talk to certain kinds of engineering I'm an ADZ leaders. Person. And I'm an ADZ. <laughs> Most of the people I had to work with were A, B, C, D. And she told me, she says, you've got to get this structured because you're off in five different tangents, and you're talking to a very senior leader, mm -hmm. and they need it A, then B then C, then D. So I learned how to communicate differently, you know, go to my weak muscle and be highly structured when mm -hmm. the situation demanded, even though it was draining, mm -hmm. right? That that wasn't always gonna be my strength, but a, a massive change in how I learned how, how do I fit in a large corporate culture? And am I only this entrepreneurial type or can I be successful at a company like Microsoft with all these different pieces? And yeah, I, I did find my own place. And it doesn't mean you, you banish your true self, but you invent it and you kind of reform it in a way that works and brings out the best. So I owe a lot to her for kind of giving me some of the harder lessons mm -hmm. on how to manage myself mm -hmm. better. Um, well, that's why you need that so. honesty for a mentor. I think of these good mentor relationships that the mentee is vulnerable, they're willing yep. to say what their fears are or whatever. Yeah, you want it honest. And you don't other... want people to just blow smoke. Right, right. And that's <laughs> so. where some of these forced marriage um, you know, mentorships don't work, where yeah. somebody says, oh, here's your mentor, good yeah. luck. And... Well, again, it's, it's, you, you develop a bond and we could help each other and we learned a lot and I ended up working for her three different times. Mm at Microsoft, and again, you tend to, you'll reform teams. The company I'm working with now, I brought back a lot of the, the folks that I work with in past because mm -hmm. we worked well as a team. And yep. I think that team feeling is what makes it fun to come in every day. Um, when I left college, I used to think, oh man, this is such a, I can't believe I have to leave. This was so much fun. Can't I do this forever? This is right, awesome. I right. better just become a professor. I'll do it all the time. <laughs> um, and you think of work as being this, you know, oh, it's not. It's actually can be just as much fun, just as collegial. Mm -hmm. You're just all working to kind of a, a common goal. So hopefully those mentorship relationships don't feel forced. Um, right. But you sort of find them out. But always offer something that you can 
provide in return. For sure. Don't ever say, hey, can I just pick your brain? I mean, you can say that, but it's helpful if you've got something to offer. Lead with something first, yeah. yeah. And it's definitely like not a machiavelli like I'm using this person as a yeah. stepping stone. It should be a friendship. Yeah. It should be a relationship that, that, that develops into a friendship. And it helps if they can be an advocate for you. For I sure. think sometimes the word, the mentorship and the advocate is an advocate is willing to suggest you for that new role or mm -hmm. that new position. Um, but back to my, you're the CEO of your own business, just don't rely on that. You've got to make your own right. Right. opportunities. Let's take the next student question. Considering your vast amount of experience in global markets, what have you learned most about business strategy from your international experience? International specifically, uh, that there is no place called Europe and there is no <laughs> place called Asia. There is Belgium, there is France, there is Germany, and they're all difficult and different and distinct. And I think some of the biggest challenges that American companies make in trying to, I'm now going to sell overseas, is thinking they can do this on an easily regional basis. And I think right now, um, since I kind of started my career internationally, came back to sort of domestic land, and now here I am again, applying the trade internationally, is I've sort of learned that because it's hard, fewer others will try to do it. Um, so trying to help American companies figure out how to sell international is kind of our, our unique sauce. I think business strategy, yeah. You know, what do you learn? I think that's something I absolutely learned in a consulting environment is how do you solve big thorny problems? And I learned it's a lot easier to solve them in PowerPoint than it is in real life. So <laughs> um, I'm a better operator because I spent a lot of time in corporate strategy. Uh, and I think I'd be a better corporate strategist again having been an operator. Um, it, there is no replacement from actually seeing how hard things are to do. Right, right. And that's the so. problem people will often have with consultants or entrepreneurs will have with the consultant yeah. is really, I mean, I could have done And they're that right. I mean, consulting is basically, I'm going to hire a lot of smart people and do incredibly good thinking and analysis and structured work, but they can't run this for me. They can't tell right. me whether it's going to work or not and whether a product works or a campaign works. There's always a degree of timing and luck and you can't beat yourself up. I think the old adage, you know, try to fail fast and get as much experience as possible. And maybe that's my career metaphor as well, is you know, not everything will be great, but keep keep moving to the yeah. next one. Learn. Um, don't. Strategy by trial and error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. learn from the past. Yeah. Don't get wedded to a dogmatic decision. Yeah. Just, it's okay uh, to pivot. And then pivoting became kind of cool right. and startup right. speak. We need oh. another word. <laughs> yeah, transition, evolve, yeah. rethink. Yeah. yeah, pivots overused, but yeah. but I but I totally agree with your point. Um, I, I want to talk about one of your diversions in your career that I found really interesting. So I'm a bit of a writer and I enjoy mm -hmm. writing. I know you um, have writing and publishing in your background. So in the early 2000s, <laughs> you became an editor of of uh, at, at a Variety, and you were focused on finance. Yeah. So you got to interview a lot of very senior people. A lot of people wanted to get into that magazine. This is back when there was really a yeah, magazine. Yeah, when I was a big <laughs> like, Which is hard to believe. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, with that experience, how, do you, how, how did that inform you as an insider when you now work with journalists? Like, what, do you, what is your approach and what, what I never think learn? they ask good enough questions and it drives me crazy. Um, no, I mean, I actually, if I were talking to a group of journalism students, I said, I would say that it's actually one of the greatest skills you can learn because really journalism and writing is being able to absorb a ton of information, make sense of it, mm -hmm. and then tell it back mm -hmm. in as factual and clear and fun a way as possible. You know, it's funny, Variety, when I was saying that I wanted to get an MBA, but I didn't want to lose time while I right. was doing it, right. Variety was this sort of this opportunity. I get to be the business finance editor. I can sort of write on the topics I like. I can write a column if I you want. Can meet cool people. I get to. I don't remember. I'm a fake American at this point. I've, I'm an American. I sound like an American, but I've spent ten years overseas. I didn't actually know anything about the U.S. entertainment market, mm -hmm. so I needed to trade something for something else. Again, back to my little wheeling mm -hmm. dealing approach. So I was allowed to be the New York bureau chief and business editor. In exchange, I get to meet all of the executives and interview them. And of course, what I was really trying to wonder is, can I work for them? Might I want to work with them? Mm. Um, so it was sort of a perfectly structured gig. And it wasn't so horrific that I, I couldn't do the MBA as well. But I think in informing how I think about journalists, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's hard to get information. What's amazing is when I was doing it, yes, we had the internet. Um, so it was always a mix of, it's very easy to find information, but if you don't, you don't know it's real. Right. 
I was still practicing journalism where you really had to be on the phone and you had to find that person and any content you wrote is because somebody had to tell you. Um, that was really hard, but again, it makes you incredibly resourceful at how to triangulate and find information, mm -hmm. draw conclusions if you don't have a ton of input, not write something if you don't know what you're talking about and wait till you can get it corroborated, because mm -hmm. that was still, right. you, had to, you know. Yes, yeah, so you had to yeah. source things and then multiple, multiple sourcing. And yeah, I mean, you couldn't just state a fact unless you could <laughs> confirm right. it twice. And yes, editors would check your notes. I mean, right. that doesn't exist now, but we, even then we were sort of cheating because you could just go to the internet and double check something. I would actually say we used it to get to the point faster, but um, no, I always wish journalists would generally ask the second and third question. Mm is go two levels down. Too often it's, I'm gonna ask my question, then I'm gonna ask my other question, and then I'm but gonna- But does that cause you to, when you're, when you're being interviewed for rhetoric, and I do wanna talk about that for a second, oh, do, you, yeah. do, you, do you kind of bring them back to the deeper question? How do you, get, how do you guide them? <laughs> I, I hate talking to journalists, I'm scared to death. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually a lot harder when the shoe's on the other foot, and I'll usually tell the journalist, this is gonna be hard because I used to do what you do. Um, but yeah, I'll try to go deeper mm -hmm. and rather than the superficial question because I'm kind of allergic to the superficial question. So back to Don't world's, like the interview, yeah, right? world's oldest millennial. I hate most advertising because I feel like I'm being humiliated. Mm. And I feel like that was one of the things I read once that millennials don't respond to advertising. They're smarter than that. I'm like, wait, me too. And I'm not a millennial. So I, I tend not to like the superficial right. question. Um, you know, again, I, you, I actually, journalism is a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. I enjoy writing. I wouldn't say I'm a journalist, but did yeah. you end up getting hired by some of those people that you interviewed? No, it was, well, not, not directly, um, did the, but, but did it learning, did it, the fact that I could reach out to many senior executives in the entertainment industry, when I decided to go, when I joined Deloitte, again, my proficiency, the fact that I, I wouldn't call it name dropping, but that we could sit in and sure. pitch to the Turner organization or Warner Brothers, whomever. And I actually would know some of these people. Mm. Now, first it was tricky because here's Deloitte, you know, very proper consulting and, and auditing company. Did they want to brag about the fact that a former journalist was in their ranks? That's a little awkward. But in the end, it was, it was the experience that was helpful. So I knew who to call and I knew mm -hmm. what the companies were. So it was, a, it was a fair trade. Was that looked down upon, a former journalist? I mean, I no, that was, that's my insecurity talking oh, again. Okay. That was probably where I was concerned. In the end, it actually worked for them because somebody right. might remember, like, oh, yeah, you, did you write that thing about the collapse right. of Vivendi? And so, so it was sort of a novelty. Um, but I'm sure that novelty did help mm -hmm. getting to Deloitte. And by the way, I never thought of myself as a journalist. I never took a journalism class. I'd never even written a letter to the editor oh, before wow. I had to write my first article. But again, if you back to your question about BA, just learn how to write and yes, think, and I think you're capable of almost anything. You're already at a good school, so you've checked the first box. The rest is just, you know, can you communicate clearly? Yeah. And I know today a lot is communicating in PowerPoint bullet points, but a well-honed sentence is worth more than five bullet points. Yeah. Well, and there's email too. I mean, you got to be able to get your point across yeah. in email. Yeah. You know, maybe you don't, you don't write an essay, but you That's true. You're able to make a point. So we'll take the, uh, the last student question. Hi there, Meredith. Hey. Uh, my question also deals with business strategy. Uh, specifically, how do you uh, get those ideas you have up on the PowerPoint slide and <laughs> change the real world in a way that actually gets you the results you want? Oh, that's a big one. I mean, I'll, I'll take any piece of it. We'll start with part one. How do you get the ideas into a document? I think the funny thing about you know, a strategy deck in PowerPoint is it all looks so easy once it's finally in PowerPoint and we jokingly mm. say, that's it? That's the strategy? Right, well, right. that didn't look that's very obvious. hard. <laughs> Isn't it obvious that Microsoft would do blah, blah, blah? No, it's not obvious. If it looks easy in PowerPoint, it usually means it was actually incredibly difficult to analyze all the different possibilities, consider what they would cost, the degree of competitive difficulty in making it happen, mm -hmm. and somehow synthesizing it cleanly to the point of, so we have two choices. We can try to compete with X or we could buy Y. We could try a different line of products outside of our worldview, right? Whatever that is, is there was a lot of working. Now, where did the ideas come from? I would always say it's because I know smart people and I ask them and, mm -hmm. I, and that's back to the journalism piece is being willing to kind of engage others. I wouldn't say no one person has all the ideas. You know, you hear the wisdom of the crowd. But it's genuinely true, if you can kind of pull together ideas. I always interview, say, 
engineering teams, if you're trying to figure out what to do with a, a product, is talk to the people inside the organization. Just because they code for a living doesn't mean they don't think constantly, well, I think we could do this better. And I don't know how we're going to compete with Google because mm -hmm. they have these five things and we don't have any of that. Or we can't recruit the right people in order to do that. The ideas tend to live. They're all there. But it's not easy to pull them out, evaluate them, make sure they're distinct, and then get an executive group to talk about them. So most business strategy work is summarizing content and making it easier for executives to kind of work through it. And the work that goes on behind the scenes is all the analysis, sizing, structuring to make that conversation possible. And it's all selling ideas. But where do ideas come from? I mean, time. Sometimes just mm -hmm. and, and, and listening to others and just pulling their ideas out and then giving them credit. Um, I'm a big believer. I don't like a lot of hierarchies. Again, I guess that makes me a, an old millennial as well. I've never been a big believer in, in hierarchies. I think the greatest ideas live all over the organization and bring as many people in to, to get their credit and take the feedback because they will help you. Um, keep people out and they feel like they're exploited, they'll never help you. Yeah, You'll have no loyalty. Own it and, and yeah. no, so. no desire to see it succeed. Um, I, I totally agree. I think that's absolutely the right approach. And, Sometimes you see that final PowerPoint and it seems obvious. What it's basically saying is here's what we're not going to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. By saying here's what we're going to do, here's what we're not going to do, which is often the hardest thing in business, yeah. I think. Because there's a million things you could do. I know. And it's really hard to have honest conversations when you're inside the tent. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to be able to sit down, I think about DirecTV. I mean, I was brought in to talk about the challenges of cord cutting and to say the, pay, the satellite pay TV industry can't survive in its current, current format. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that anyone didn't believe it, but in polite company, you couldn't talk about that. And similarly at Microsoft, I railed against Windows Phone, as did many of us. We knew that the business model couldn't work. Right. But there's such a cultural bias that, well, this is the Windows model. We license software to hardware companies. Yep. I say, yeah, but Android, look at Android. It's going to be free. They'll be the new ecosystem. Yep. It's how do you tell truth to power? Um, carefully, very, very mm -hmm. carefully. Um, and being able to have mm -hmm. honest conversations is actually one of the hardest things in a large corporation. Were people buying the, the cable, cut the cable message when you were there? Were, how many I mean, people in here pay yeah. for cable? Or satellite or any traditional or satellite. TV, yeah. I mean, they're like, what's cable? Like, somebody grabbed someone else's hand back there. That was nice yeah. of them. I mean, But there's not many people no. that are paying for cable in this room. No, and you would have thought that in 2014 that this wouldn't be a hard case for me to make when sitting down with management. It's like, you do realize this business is dying, right? Yep. You just can't walk into a room and say it's dying. You have to say, I actually think if we get the over-the-top product built sooner, we may not make a lot of money on it, and there's going to be some degree of cannibalization. Yep. But we've got the best brand to be the leader in OTT. And we, we actually did look at buying Hulu um, and using that as a platform, didn't get the price. Um, and ultimately, I think DirecTV did the right thing and, and sold itself to AT&T. But that was a classic case of, I'm not sure anyone didn't know it, but acknowledging that this company that pays you so well mm -hmm. and the revenues are yep. pouring in, the cash flow is still there, is that to acknowledge that in that this room, this percentage, and I literally had a picture that had generation by generation that we were just going to fall off a cliff. Yeah. I mean, the unfortunate reality is if you only have five years to retirement and I'm <laughs> telling you the business is going to pretty much be dead in six. Right. You're good. And so that's what it felt like. I a mean, lot it's of the time. classic innovator's dilemma, oh, yeah. which yeah. you and I know and well. But yeah. if anyone here is not familiar with that book, Innovator's Dilemma, it's still a classic. It's still a classic. It's because still of true. Because things like this, because yeah. it's basically the, what gets you there, what gets a big company successful. Microsoft definitely had to deal with this. Yeah. Um, often is what kills you. So it's, it's the ultimate it's, dilemma. It's hard, and that's again back to small companies can usually disrupt much more easily because they're not competing with anything. Right. You're creating something new. Um, the original company has a lot to defend. So how do you both innovate right, right. and defend at the same time? You've got to eat your time. own lunch or someone yeah. else will eat it for you. Yeah. So last question, um, I want to talk a little bit about rhetoric and you sold wanted. And I love what you said. You <laughs> said, I went in there not to fire people, but to fire people up. Yeah. It was a difficult situation. You got that company on the right track. You sold that business. So you're at rhetoric now. What do you think you're going to leverage into that business based on you know what, all the things we've talked about, how your careers has ro rolled out, and then what do you think you're going to come out the other side with that'll take you to that next that next jo job? Yeah, it's a great question because I I was joking with Tim Baskerville, who always pulls me into these things. I'm like, how is it that I keep going to smaller companies 
with greater risk and I earn less money. <laughs> you know, I, I take a lower salary each time and I think it's... But you're getting equity. Exactly, exactly. It's going to be huge. Yeah. Um, that this was actually a return to my roots in some ways, that this is a much more purely entrepreneurial mm. setting. Um, we bought a small company, but we're basically building a new one on top of it. And it's because of the last business I was in that I learned a lot about data architecture and data science and how to build very precise and clear use cases, not try to boil oceans. Because if you, you know, when I was first trying to get my head around big data, I was so enamored with the people who were good at it. They're like, oh my gosh, you can do this and mm -hmm. this and this. And wow, I can't even comprehend what's possible. Right. So you let a lot of this happen. I've now learned there's a lot of things you can do, but just focus on a couple of things and always understand the consumer. And I think in this time around, we get to build um, a piece of technology that can actually be quite transformative by being highly focused. That, you know, I'm getting my own ego in check too. You know, we don't have to solve everything, mm -hmm. but man, we're gonna hit it out of the park with security software. I'm gonna mm -hmm. understand how security software is bought and sold everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And maybe I won't be as good at marketing or cloud services, but we're going to go deep. So I think the chance to learn something new, again, I think it's what keeps me young, is what did I know about marketing intelligence systems? Well, what I learned at HG, but yep. not a lot. Yep. I'm learning. I mean, I am, yep. I'm a student every day. I'm insecure and feeling out of my depth every day, but I think that's what the drive is. Um, but I do think this is, we're joking that this time around, I'm learning something I never, I'd never had to go out to the market and fundraise. Mm -hmm. That's a new, talking to these VC types, man, they are. Not fun. <sighs> yeah, the less, time, the less time you spend in the company of VCs, the better. <laughs> so, that's, so that's a new, that's a new, you know, a mm -hmm. new skill for my, for my tool belt. Right, and um, I'm sure you'll leverage that in the future too. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, I really appreciate you coming today. I think it's, a, it's really a compelling journey. It's interesting that you're humble, self-aware, I would love for all the students to, you know, be sitting in, in a chair like this in, in a few years and have some. Well, of that. I think the lesson, if I can be sitting here, then then certainly but you see, can. Because you, <laughs> you keep saying that you're, that, you know, you're insecure. I mean, I think that's what drives people. I'm insecure. You, well, that's why my point is that insecurity doesn't have to be a negative. I walk thing. into a group of, of VCs and I think, oh, all these people are better. They know more than me, and they don't. But, I think you'll find all the other people's insecurities and you'll get along better. Yeah, um, yeah. The, what makes me un uncomfortable or even feisty and deeply competitive, because while I'm saying I'm insecure, I'm also deeply competitive. I right, wouldn't right. have done all this if I didn't like to win or if not publicly win, very privately win. Yeah. Um, but I don't like arrogance and I don't like to be around arrogant people and I don't take bluster as a sign of competence. Nope. So I tend to because find it usually isn't. It usually isn't. So I tend to surround myself with people who have different skills than I do but share a common thread of being just insecure enough. And <laughs> last point on insecurity, and I honestly can't remember the source of this, but when we're sort of in post MBA recruiting rounds and there was sort of the group of the people wanted to go to investment banking yep. and those of us who were more inclined toward consulting. And I think it was the McKinsey recruiter who or somebody no, it was actually Deloitte who said the, when you're in a, the environment that the truly ambitious, take no prisoners type, mm. yeah, they're perfect for banking. Yep. We look for a degree, just enough insecurity <laughs> to work so hard because you're so scared of failing that you'll keep working to make sure you don't let your client down. Yet your ego won't be in the way that when you're in a client meeting that you never forget you're there to help them not to be the star of the show. Hmm. And I thought, I didn't realize at the time, but they had turned it into an actual recruiting strategy. They knew exactly the gene they were looking for. Right. And that was insecurity in a good way, right? It doesn't mean you don't have confidence. Quiet confidence actually projects very well. Mm -hmm. So I've probably used the phrase too much insecurity, but I just think it, it definitely propelled me to the next step. And now I'm sitting here, I think I'm finally confident or a little more confident, at least until next week, and something <laughs> will make me feel, I don't know what I'm talking about again. So I think you're highly confident. And I mean, John made confident. it easier. I mean, you flatter me, then it's all uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, God. Well, thank you so, so much for coming. You're very welcome. Thank you.